he's out there, and he's a couple hours early, and he remembers he's got a letter that he was supposed to mail, and he forgot where the post office was, and he forgot his phone back at the hotel. So he sees a kid on a bike, and he says to the kid, he waves him, he says, hey, could you help me find the post office? And the kid says, sure, it's, you just, this is Main Street, just go up Main Street, about four blocks, there's a light, take a left, it's three blocks, it's right on the corner, you can't miss it. And the speaker said, I'd like to invite you later on, we're going to do a, a talk at the Unity Church. The kid says, well, what is it about? He says, well, finding the kingdom. The kid thought about it for a second and says, well, I think I'll pass. You couldn't even find the post office. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm not sure what I'm doing up here. <laughs> you know, sometimes the kingdom of heaven is really close to us. I don't know, probably some of the older folks here, have you ever done this? Lynn, where, where did I put my glasses? Do you guys know where my glasses are? I could have swore. And, and I, seriously, this has happened. I've gone out to the car, upstairs, downstairs. Kids, do you know where dad's glasses are? So the kingdom of heaven could be closer than that. Or it could come as an intense experience. Eckhart Tolle in The Power of Now. I don't know if anyone's read that book. But I, rem I don't remember if it was weeks or months, but it was such an amazing experience of, of an opening that he couldn't get off the park bench. Now, I was going to name this talk Brainwashing and the Mindless Path. <laughs> but I didn't think Sue would let me up here. <laughs> we get about 50,000 thoughts per day. And I don't know about you, but... I don't need more thoughts. I need less mind, more and more heart. And who, and who couldn't stand to get a nice washing of your brain? I don't want a dirty brain. You see, even our language is rooted in duality. And if we're not careful, language itself can serve to separate us from truth, from the kingdom, and from each other. But when we put our faith in the kingdom and not just believe, then Jesus telling us to love our neighbors as ourselves takes on a new meaning that has real power to change lives. It can turn hate into love and violence into compassion. And my Lord, do we need this? Just look at all the pain and suffering around us. The famous American psychologist William James, in his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, names those who come to the spiritual experience or path through intense suffering, like himself, as being twice born. So for me, that puts me at about seven and a half years old, like my oldest grandson. I don't know if Sue knew she was having a seven-year-old up here giving a talk. <laughs> I listened to, yesterday we listened to Sue's uh, pre-video about that I was going to offer you the whole kit and caboodle. I don't have time for all of that, but I think I can get to the kit and the ka. The boodle's going to have to wait for another day. <laughs> My wonderful wife made this picture here, and the area inside the heart represents the kingdom. The garden, heaven on earth or in plain everyday language, uncaused peace and joy. And if you search and you delve past in all the major religions, past the, into the esoteric, past the dogmatic, the Jewish Kabbalah, the Islam Sufism, the Hindu Advaita Vedanta, Buddhism, and the Christian mystics, you'll find at their core there's one teaching, and that there is one truth, one reality, one divine, infinite knowing being. And we all share that being. And we call it God. That's as good as name as anything. So the nature of God, therefore, is our nature. And it feels like inside the body is peace and joy. But here's the kicker. We can't find it. 
We are it. Just like our eyes, everything we focus on, we see and we can name. But your eyes can't turn itself around and see itself. It's impossible. We can go to a mirror, but we see a reflection of ourselves. The sun is self-illuminating. Ask the sun to turn its warmth and its light around. It cannot do that. But would anyone say that the sun doesn't exist or that our eyes don't exist? But our self-illuminating self, that which we are, people miss. They ignore. So could original sin being thrown out of the kingdom be nothing more than forgetting? We leave the garden as children as our egos develop. We begin as a child to feel a sense of me, a self that's separate, that ends at the skin. So I am what is inside, and everything else out there is not me. It seems logical, and ego formation is a natural process humans go through. But there comes a time in life, like all things that have lived past its usefulness, to let go of it. So the ego can recede to the background, and our unique one-of-a-kind personality can shine in the foreground. Reconnecting to our divine nature can be as simple as remembering that we are the peace and joy we've searched for. You see, my life only started when I began to live a life outside the confines of this skin. And if divine love is an infinite circle that includes the entire universe as its body, the ego is a stunted love that only circles one body and maybe a few others. Forgetting is kind of like a veil that descends, covering our inherent peace and joy. The veil is just another name for ego. And some veils are so thick, they're like blackout curtains. We used those when our kids were little, designed to keep out the light. They serve a purpose, at keeping the kids <laughs> sleeping in, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But we can see the result of extreme veiling in our society, people like Putin or Hitler so cut off from the light, so full of fear and hatred. But yet with compassion in our hearts, we understand that this veiling or shielding was necessary to protect the innocent child. The extreme veiling was custom designed to literally save the life of the child and its sanity. At the core of all spiritual traditions, there's a call to love all, but not a call that says we must like everyone or condone bad or evil behavior. In fact, loving wisdom might call us to action as appropriate for every situation. I think that's wisdom. About four years ago, Lynn and I went to England and Wales. We went for a week-long spiritual retreat put on by Rupert Spira, who I'm going to have to give a shout-out. I'm very grateful for his teachings have informed a lot of what I'm going to say here today. Now, prior to arriving in London, I was listening to this meditation from this guy on this app, which was all about minding the gap. And the repetitive instruction was mind the gap. Find the gap between two thoughts or two feelings or two perceptions. So mind the gap over and over was the meditation. So fast forward a few days. We're standing at the platform in the underground in London waiting for our first train. We were really excited. It was kind of cool. And all of a sudden at the platform, I hear this disembodied voice, mind the gap, mind the gap. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm, I'm at the right place. <laughs> Synchronicity. You know, God loves a good chuckle. One day after the Monday night class that I attended here for three years, The Way of Mastery, I was so excited and high from the amazing open sharing. I was driving home on Highway 287, we live in Broomfield, when suddenly my mood deflated. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I, I had such a great time. All of a sudden, a car pulls up in front of me, and for some reason, I looked at the license plate, and the license plate said, I am love. Now, of course, 
the doubting, my doubting mind and the analytical mind would chalk it up to coincidence. But I no longer listened much to that voice. And of course, I had to call my friend, Beth Under Avenue, and tell her all about it. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> Rupert Spira says that there is love, the veiling of love, but never the absence of love. Expanding that, we could say there is always beauty, the veiling of beauty, but never its absence. Or truth, the veiling of truth, but never its absence. And I'd like to put forth a definition of truth. Truth is that which comes at all times, in all places, for all people, all things, and under all circumstances. Now, we can have different experiences of truth. We're going to. As many people as there are here will all have a different experience of truth. But there's just one truth. My faith is that there is one truth, and we call it God or I am. And we all know this in our deepest core, and we feel it as presence, like right now, just this feeling of presence. Now, I'm a firm believer in the power of three, so we talked about Memorial Day two times. So I'd like to take just 30 seconds, if everybody will call up in their heart a loved one, and just allow that love. I think a sacred memory is one that has the power to take a memory and bring us to the love in this moment, presence now. And just let that flow through you as grace. I've been thinking about my sister, our sister, for a while. The three direct paths back to the garden are truth, love, and beauty. Thinking, feeling, perceiving, mind, body, world. Three pathways, one God. Seventy years ago, my life completely dramatically changed. I gave up the search for happiness through objects and delved fully into the spiritual journey. What is the source of light or consciousness? What is real? What am I? What is God? I went from a businessman fully engrossed in daily life running my companies and fully engaged in family life to retiring early and going on a spiritual journey. Abruptly, I went from zero interest in spirituality directly to the path in God. And first for me, it came as prayer. And when I finally opened to hearing and seeing in a new way, the answers flooded in because I was ready. So grace took my hand and has not let go since. In fact, I was having so many wonderful mystical experiences. <laughs> I'm not going to go there, Beth. I needed to find help, teachers to guide me. I remember truthfully telling God, okay, I get it. Enough, enough with the experiences. <laughs> and at times I was afraid I was losing my mind. But now I'm so grateful for having lost it. You see, I lost my mind, but I gained back my heart and soul. Seven years later now, at the end of each day, I ask myself, was I kinder today? Did judgment of both myself and others diminish today? If so, then I put a chalk mark on the goodness side of life's blackboard. Kinder, but not this kind of kindness. This is, uh, I found this, I thought it was so cool. They mean, how we get them, give us cave. Maybe we kill with kindness. <laughs> Not that kind of kindness. <laughs> you see, I found the genuine automatic kindness that erupts spontaneously from the heart and brings blessings beyond anything I could have imagined. Lynn, my wife, and I had a magical second honeymoon in Taos, New Mexico. <laughs> I was just beginning to have these amazing spiritual experiences and remember turning to her and saying, I'm God. <laughs> Quickly, she said, don't say that. <laughs> and, 
And she said, they'll put you away or worse. <laughs> and and it's just, I told her, no, no, you, you don't understand. I am God, but you are God. And Stephen is God and Beth is God and we're all God. And I said, and that's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me, God. She said, okay, okay, but please keep it to yourself. <laughs> well, I'm here, so I'm not really good at keeping it to myself. How could I not share what I've gone through in the last seven years? Now, when I was 12 years old in 1867, I mean 1967, <laughs> I, for, for those of you my age or more, you remember those little transistor radios? And now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cheat a little bit. I'm going to say it had a speaker. But back when the transistors came out, there was just an earplug that came, one little yellow earplug that you put in. I, and I think maybe we could get four or five AM stations. Wow, that's really cool. Now, imagine this, an alien comes down, and he's never been here before, and he sees me as a kid, and I drop my radio, and it breaks into pieces. The alien, being very logical and analytical, would notice that the music stopped. He would rightly assume that, the, in hard evidence to prove it, that the music came from what was inside the transistor radio. But we know the music doesn't stop because one radio breaks, does it? Could it be our divine essence, just like the music, is not generated by the mechanics of the body-mind? And so when the body dies, the music doesn't stop. The spirit still shines. We go nowhere. Could it be? I think so. There is a change to the temporary form that God was masquerading as while playing this divine part. Many in our Western society believe what we are ends when the body dissolves. Now we can believe differently, but beliefs don't carry us very far, especially when we come up against tough times. But having a direct felt experience of this comes first from a sincere desire and will to know. As Jesus said, it only takes the faith of a mustard seed and grace will come and take us the rest of the way home. Being aware of being aware, the light knowing itself as itself, it verifies our divinity and then our beliefs of separation dissolve over time. And I don't want to vilify the mind. As a tool, the analytical mind is awesome, but as a master, it's tragic. And we can see the horrible consequences of a society that has lost touch with our essential divine being and instead puts thinking on the throne. We're committing violence against ourselves and others. We're devastating the planet and making war. There are more microparticles in the ocean than stars in the Milky Way. 264 people in this country every single day are killed by guns homicide and suicide. So my fervent hope is that many more people take their own journey of discovery because the more that are healed, the more healing expands. When we live from separation or ego, we live as a fraction and then our lives are lived mainly in reaction. But reconnecting to source, responsibility turns to the ability to respond. Judgment turns to wise discernment from a hole in the soul to wholeness. The spiritual path begins with an intense burning desire to know truth, reality, and God. And many of us on the path have been through years and seen through years that objects cannot bring the happiness and peace we seek. More money, nicer home, better relationships, better job, even better physical health won't bring us the uncaused joy and peace we long for. The direct spiritual path and teaching is this. We're already that which we seek for in our heart of hearts. And love, we discover, is at the center of our longing for it. How would we know what love is if we haven't tasted it? And if we look for love in others, we look in the wrong place. We'll push people away. It's too heavy a burden to ask another to create love inside ourselves. So could it be this simple? 
I think it is. God's name is I am, as was told to Moses on Mount Sinai. And when Jesus tells us I am the way, the truth, and the life, could he have meant not the I am as a person, but the I am that we all are? He also tells us the Father and I are one. So there's only one I am, not eight billion I am's. God writes his signature in our mind and we think I am. She infuses our heart with love and we feel it in this moment as presence. And I can say with 100% certainty I am and so can everyone else. When we see this, but more importantly when we feel this, that my I am is your I am, that is the experience of love. It's a disillusion of otherness, of boundaries. One of the experiences I remember is our first son, Alex, when he was born. It was like a dual quarterback, so the doctor and I were there waiting. And <laughs> so the doctor says to me, would you like to cut the cord? And I said, yeah, sure. Well, I didn't say actually anything. All of a sudden, there's a scissors in my hand. And, I, you know, my mind was blown away. And I go to cut, and he goes, stop, that's my finger. <laughs> now, <laughs> you can ask Lynn. This, this is God's honest truth. But I, my mind was gone. Just my heart was there. You see, the word love, think about L-O-V-E. There's no I or you in love. So no IOU, IOUs are created. Love isn't transactional, it's transformational. And Jesus explains this inside or outside beautifully. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. I am the all. Cleave a piece of wood and I am there. Lift up a stone and you will find me there. And to the disciples, Jesus said, to them, when you make the two into the one, and when you make the inner like the outer and the upper like the lower, then you will enter the kingdom. He, he explains to us that there is no inside or outside. And the other pathway of beauty, Lynn and I went to Lake Powell about 35 years ago and spent a few days on a houseboat. And there weren't any bedrooms left, so we slept on top. And I remember most vividly the entire Milky Way. And back then, you know, it was a lot darker, and there were no trees. And I was blown away. It was just an amazing experience. In Buddhism, they call that nirvana. And nirvana just means blown outward. Our mind is gone. Kind of like the hippies of the 60s. Wow, man, that blew me away. The disillusion of the boundary between a me and nature is called beauty, just like love. Now, I'm gonna, there's two main reasons that I'm here, and I'm going to tell you, I think I've got time. I'll, I'll talk quick. <laughs> so about three and a half years ago, pr previous to COVID, uh, I was starting, all of a sudden I'm writing poetry. Where did that come from? I mean, I'm a finance guy and a businessman. Um, and I'm writing poetry upstairs, and I'm accessing some really deep trauma and pain from my childhood. And all of a sudden I get a panic attack. Now, I haven't had any panic attacks. And all of a sudden I'm on the floor, barely able to breathe, but I could dial 911. So the next thing I knew is I was on a gurney at the top of our stairs. And then the next thing I saw or knew was just a white light. And I'm like, okay, cool, white light, what's next? But the next thing I noticed as my mind came back online was a, sh a vertical shaft of something that wasn't white. It was less than white or darker than white. And so my mind was interested in that, and that shaft became bigger and bigger and bigger. And as my mind came online, I noticed it was actually a doorway opening, and the white light moved up. Well, I found myself laying in an ambulance. My arm hurt because they had put IVs in, and they didn't do a good job. And I heard Mike 
Come on. Come on, Mike. So there are three takeaways I think uh, I had from that experience I'll never forget. When I was upstairs on the floor and having this panic attack, by the way, I want to let you know on my father's side, a lot of heart disease. My cousin in his 40s, he was an attorney. He died after a case walking down the courtroom steps. My uncle died in his 60s from sudden heart failure. My father had his first heart attack in his 50s. So that didn't help the panic attack. I thought, I could, I could be in trouble here. But I was on the floor, and, some, and this meditation and all the experiences I've had up to that point, even though I was, the pain wasn't horrible, but it was there. And I realized that in that moment, I could die, but that I wouldn't die in fear, that the fear would die in me, that what I was is bigger than fear. That's my first takeaway. The second takeaway was when the white light changed to an ambulance, I couldn't stop laughing. I just broke out. I go, God is a joker. What the heck's going on here? I was expecting this amazing experience. I think, I think laughter, you know, God giggles and we laugh, and I think that's wonderful. And the third was, at some point in that white light, which is timeless, I couldn't say how long it is, a second, a minute, or forever, it felt like I had a choice. And at first it felt like I didn't want to come back. But then something happened, I can't really say in words, but every particle, every atom, every mason and gluon knew that if I did come back, there's only one reason to come back, and that's for love. To do the best I could as a human to love. Jesus tells his disciples how to know when the, this knowledge has really taken hold in them. He says, if they ask of you, what is the evidence of the Father within you? Say to them, it's a motion and a rest. So we feel this kingdom in our bodies as peace. Peace is joy at rest. Joy is peace in motion. Now I would say that I'm currently in the school of how to live as and in presence <laughs> without personal pretense. Silence is God's language. Truth is God's mind. Beauty is God's body. And love is God's heart. And all of us are that. There's a crossroads many people come to in life, a crucial life-altering moment when we notice that the world at its core is unknowable and we have a choice. We either try to control life, resist some things we deem bad, desire other things we deem good, like a rubber band we're constantly pulled, or we simply fall in love with the mystery of the unknown and take each day as it comes. And then, as humans, we just do our best. Now, if you choose the latter, life is like jumping out of an airplane at 40,000 feet. There's good news and there's some bad news. <laughs> the bad news, you don't have a parachute. The good news, there's no ground. I encourage you all to jump from the safety, safety of your treasured beliefs and take the leap of faith. And I have a poem I wrote. Did I skip a bunch of parts, Liv? I don't know. <laughs> there we go. Oops. There we go. Thank you. So I wrote this about four years ago. Can you hear? It was during a walk in my neighborhood of trails and familiarity when it happened. Lost in thought, my steps along the path in retrospect seemed taken of their own accord. The time was pre-pandemic, but ripe with the politic of division and derision. 
A depressive fog that seemed to judge every step clouded my mind, and there was an internal raging at the sheer stupidity and ignorance of humanity. How devastating the world, I thought, spinning around its access of lust and power, greed and fear, hate and envy, and now in this information age, so in your face on display in all forms of media, from Fox News to Facebook. And in this country especially, guns replacing goodwill. The fear of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, subject to the whims of a growing violence, now a real threat to life and limb. So it came as a shock the power of compassion, abruptly waking me out of so dire a reverie and appearing in the form of such a simple thing, a worn leather glove perched on the tip top of an ordinary green garden stake, which was tied to a young evergreen, giving the tree needed support and buttress against the fierce winds life sometimes gives all of us. The gloved stake spoke to me just like an electric shock to the heart speaks clearly of life and death, and yet at the same time was also communicated by the way of a gentle tap on the shoulder, much like a friend might do. The voice, at first I didn't hear it, being 60 years deaf to the message offered, I walked past the supported tree. I was never taught this language in school. No school offered a course on how to open myself to the mystical melody of silence or to find fullness of understanding in the emptiness between words. And minding the gap wouldn't be just a t-shirt I bought at a London gift shop, but a lived reality. No class on how to fall in love with truth. My heart skipped, my step faltered, and I stood still, timeless in the cold, but no longer cold-hearted. Someone with a loving heart and kind hands had bent over, picking the glove off the frozen ground and placed it carefully on the stake. It was done, now obvious to me, with sweet intent, placing it in the best possible position so that the owner, if he came looking, would have a good chance to find it. Just kindness. Tears of joy came unbidden. Such a wonderful thing, a selfless act, so simple, so ordinary, so hopeful. That was about four years ago, that cold, blustery day that nevertheless had warmed my heart. And at the time, I decided not to write about this. It was just too simple. People do acts of kindness all the time, no big deal. Not something to put pen to paper. And so about three weeks later, life again provided the message I most needed to hear, again stopping my tracks, this time by a bench with a bronze memorial plaque affixed to the back, celebrating the life of a now lost but clearly loved parent. And as I stopped to read it, I noticed a stray leather glove on the ground. With a chuckle and a spreading warmth, I bent over and placed the glove on the bench, displaying it in the best way possible so that it might be found, or maybe just bring a simple smile to a passerby. I headed home, now listening to the message forgotten, started writing this story. And as I finished the tale, I now remember the last part of the lesson. I had forgotten it, being said as it was in the softest of whispers, in a language foreign, still somewhat new, yet so powerful. Love grows exponentially. Kindness takes roots and spreads. So, pass it on. Thank you.